Welcome to the finals, Haunted Mines. Our first map in the best of five. We are down to the top four teams, everybody. And it's still wild to me that coming out of the qualifiers, the top two teams in the ranking are not with us anymore. So it's going to be super interesting to see which team wins the tournament. Yeah, definitely we're in for a few surprises no matter what happens. Now we're going into best of five. So we have Haunted Mines our first map. Now again, draft rule is you can only draft the hero once within the series. There is no pre-bans, no other shenanigans like this. But you can only see a hero once in uh, a match. Which is by the way really interesting because I had people on my YouTube videos about the Banshee Cup complain to me it's always the same hero picked for every single map and I'm just like sitting there thinking that is literally not possible in this tournament so what are you talking about so yeah some people out there I mean honestly they are as blind as they are brain dead it is incredible to me so yeah I had a good laugh though when I saw that comment. I was just like, dude, we put, we put rules into play so that you don't have to see the same hero every single map, but yeah, nice try. So, either way, now that we're going into our first bands here, once again, also a reminder that we have bounties in the game. So we introduced that as a little bit of a twist for the playoffs, and I'm gonna show that with you in a second. So these are the bounties that you can go for. As I mentioned, the bounties are optional. You don't have to do any of this, but if you complete a bounty, then you get an additional $50. So that's some nice pizza money for the team. And if you feel like you're a superior team, for example, maybe you're ahead 2-0, then you can start to throw some bounties out and try and win some games this way. Now, we have a couple of teams that already tried bounties. So far, only one was completed, though. But you can see that there are a couple of ways now how the teams can try to just pad up their prize money a little bit. But every single team that is now in the top four already gets prize money. So we have the prize money split amongst the top four, which is quite important in that context. Now, I should probably mention this here too. We just also announced this in the second season for the Banshee Cup. We're going to have a second season and we will adjust the bounties and some other things as well just to make it more interesting for the teams too. You could tell that during the playoffs here a lot of the teams were a little bit torn between going for a bounty but they also thought that they could make it, you know, in the next round and didn't want to risk anything which is absolutely understandable. So the first season of the Banshee Cup was for us also to test the system a little bit to see what worked, what didn't work, uh, feedback from the teams, feedback from the audience and we are adjusting for the second season to make sure that all of the all that feedback is yeah is just being listened to and i think we have a couple of really cool ideas on how to make that work so now i'm not going to spoil everything with you but for now there is going to be a second season and we're going to have a captain's draft for it so individual players can sign up we are going to have bounties again but they will be changed slightly to make them more interesting now that we're heading into our first map, we already have quite a few uh, healers actually banned out. Sylvanas Hogger picked on the side of the Enjoyers. And when we're talking about Team Ash with all of the aggression that they're usually bringing, we now have Might try apparently again with that Blaze main tank that he's been playing a few times. Now don't get me wrong, if they now decided that they would put Blaze onto the side lane, they could easily swap that around. But he has played Blaze as a main tank already. I'm just saying there's a chance that they're going to try and do that again here. What is a bit wild to me is that Sylvanas made it through the draft on Haunted Mines. Because we're not getting Haunted Mines all that often these days, but when we do, Sylvanas is usually one of the first heroes that gets banned because she is amazing here. You don't even have to go into the mines. She can, can just push the lane, for example. Or once that you get a big golem, you can use her to make things even more troublesome for your opponent. Now let's see how this is going to play out. I specifically want to see what happens with Blaze. Is Morena's going to play him? Or are they using Blaze main tank as my try has already done? I believe one time so far? I don't think it was more than once. He did it in uh, the group stage if I'm not mistaken. Anuin gets picked together with Diablo. So we got Dibbles at the front, Hogger on the side lane, Sylvanas for all that push power. And I would say at this point it's kind of fair to say that Team Ash is definitely one of the favorites. There's obviously also the space goofs and a few more, like we're gonna go into the second match then later. But yeah, it's it's really wild. Like if <laughs> I have honestly no idea who's gonna win the tournament right now. So on the one hand it's a bit sad that some of the top teams haven't made it, but then again, they lost. They lost in the group stage. Okay, we get Varian as the main tank and we get Grey main. So no Blaze main tank shenanigans, we get Varian here. I mean, they could play main tank Blaze and then play Varian with twin blades and go for the bounty. Just saying. That's an option. 
if they really wanted to do that. Which leaves us with the final pick, of course. So on the red team side, as we're heading into map number one of the best of five, we have the Enjoyers with Ether right now. And what they, what they need is a bit more damage. Melee range doesn't really matter, but they need a bit more oomph. And they go for that melee variation. Arthurs as the final pick. Ladies and gentlemen, the finals of Banshee Cup season and number one are starting officially right now here on Haunted Mines. Haunted Mines, game number one. Team Ash on the left in blue with Renella on Brightwing, Maitri on Varian. We have Bishops on Genji, Murenas on Blaze, and Lopaka on Greymane. So on the right side of the map, the Enjoyers with Lavakal on Anduin, Arion on Sylvanas. We got Ether on Arthurs, Ritchu on Hogger, and Itrax is playing Diablo. Now, the bad news first for all bounty hunters, it seems like we're gonna get a taunt variation of Varian, which again makes also the most sense with what they're doing here. But I can totally understand that a lot of people were looking at the draft and just hoping that Varian would be played by Morenas and that maybe they would go for meme blades. But yeah, that's not a thing. So, uh, let's see how this one plays out. Also, by the way, just as a bit of a side note, uh, we haven't really said this. Now, with the bounties in play, that obviously increased the maximum price pool to $3,600, right? Initially, we were talking always about $2,500 of the price pool. And as we came up with a bounty idea and we were trying to see, okay, what would happen if the maximum number of bounties would be completed, it turned out that the price pool would be 3,600. Kevin, being the absolute boss that he is, said like, you know what, I don't care. We're going for it, let's do it. But currently it seems that there's actually a chance that not enough bounties are gonna be completed in order to uh, to go to, uh, like even to 2,500. So just as a bit of a side note for you, if that's gonna be the case we are still going to be paying out 2500 and again massive shout out to kevin to psykiv the heroes of the storm sugar daddy that has been a huge part in the last few years of trying to keep the esports scene here alive host tournaments with us so yeah big shout out to him and all that he does for the scene here so something for the players as well so we're not ending up with less prize money as initially promised because of the bounties not being as actively completed as we expected. I mean, there's a lot of teams that tried. It's just that most of them failed so far. The only team that was able to complete a bounty was the Bratwurst boys. I personally think that within the best of five system that we have now in the finals, it's highly likely that we're going to see a few more bounties come in. But I don't necessarily believe we're going to get one for every game. I mean, from the start, it was always voluntarily. It was always an option. It was never meant to force the teams into anything but as i already said earlier for the second season of the banshee cup we already have a few ideas to tweak the system slightly to make it much more attractive for the players to actually go for bounties and that is i think in the interest of the players and also of course in the interest of the audience so you can very much look forward to that season number one <laughs> i mean as much fun as it was already it was also for us a tool to just see what works what doesn't and how the feedback is from everybody so either way, we now have level 4 on uh, both sides, and as expected, Taunt is the play for Varian, so now he's actually a real hero. I'm a real boy! That he finally has his level 4, and the mines are opening up, so it is Golan time! We are gonna get some skulls. Arthur's over here. Arthur's is actually really nice against... Oh, that's a kill. Yep, Diablo is down. First blood for Team Ash. I would venture to say that Team Ash is one of the favorites currently to take the tournament. We have a couple of heavy hitters still, but let's not forget that the teams that we initially thought would make it not only in the top four, but potentially also in the entire tournament, did not make it out of the group stage. First and foremost, the Bratwurst boys. Probably the biggest upset, I mean by far, that we had in ages has happened in Group A as the Bratwurst boys lost twice. Once to the Space Goofs and once to Team Ash. Absolutely incredible. They, they won every single qualifier that they participated in and then in the group stage they got absolutely wrecked. So uh, a huge disappointment for all the Bratwurst fans. But again, as we're now in the tournament, I gotta admit, it's kinda nice that you're looking at a couple of teams and you have absolutely no idea who's gonna win it. 
It's like you're literally sitting there and it's like, um, yeah, I think these guys could take it, but they've also lost a couple of weird ones. And these other boys are also pretty good, so yeah, it's, it's more than just a bit interesting. Anyways, one kill is all that we got so far, four minutes in, but with each team already going for some of the skulls in the Haunted Mines, we now have camps being focused upon once again. Oh, Genji, careful my friend. Yeah, Bishops has a bit of a problem. Jumped in and Diablo immediately slammed him into a wall. Reminded me a little bit of the D.Va trailer. Yeah, that was... Uh, <laughs> that diva trailer. I mean, it was honestly on a qualitative side, it was well done. I still don't know if I'm pissed about this trailer or if I liked it. I love the part where Diablo and Genji were just battling it out, and Diablo just slamming Genji into a corner, but Diva to the rescue was uh, weird. It was just so weird. It was a bit of a bait and switch right there. I think we all expected something epic, and then Diva! <laughs> it's like, alright, whatever. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know what you think about that trailer, but I, I thought like on the one hand it was pretty cool, on the other hand I was, I was like, Diva, really? Nah, 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 yeah, okay. So, either way, as is, seems like and uh, Sylvanas might have a bit of an issue, and then just pulled out of the fight last second. We have still the big boss down in the mines, so he's still up, and it seems like Team Ash is going to be the one to start and make a play here. So... How is their opponent going to react? This is the moment where you just want to use Sylvanas. Just push the lane. Push the lane to damage. You might not get the best uh, the best golem, the strongest one, but as long as you take your opponent's structures down, you're fine. And the fort is already getting damaged. Now Blaze is slowly starting to move in. Yeah, they have to still deal with the fort, but of course here comes the flank. Renella on right wing, cautious, and he gets killed. Lavakal with Anduin is also in the corner, so Anduina goes down. And, yeah, Morena's is also getting eliminated. So, we have two of the heroes down on the blue team side, which is, I think, not really what they were aiming for here. It's just a bit wild on the when you think about it. They were the ones flanking in, hoping to get the kills, and instead, they are now getting crushed. As long as Sylvanas gets out, but Genji is coming in and drops her. So, nicely done here. It's kind of spicy all of a sudden. It took us ages to get to the first kill. But now everybody is just swinging here, and I kind of like it. I mean, the big golem still goes to the blue team. That's not going to change. Bishops is now going to move in in order to get the remaining skulls, which for some reason they left on the ground as Ether pauses the game. But as I said before, when you have Sylvanas, you can just easily go for structures. And just compare this real quickly. So this one is now down to 50% HP. The golem is going to spawn up at the top and we'll have to still go for the fort here. So as long as they defeat it easily, and I mean, this is the first objective, right? This is not like it's the third, the fourth or whatever that scaled into the late game. There is a good chance that there's going to be more damage done to the blue team structures compared to their opponents. So time will tell. I mean, with that said, there's also still a couple of camps that they can now try and take before the objective kicks in. And honestly, it's going to be 65 skulls against 35. So yes, there is a difference, but with the first objective, it usually doesn't really play that much of a role. They also can still try and make a couple of moves with Sylvana. She's going to be back in time for this. We have three kills against two right now. And just on the damage output alone, you have, of course, also Hogger there, who is currently even top damage in the game and rotates towards the top to face off against Blaze as he's trying to control the lane there and push it out a bit further. It's also the lane where the, the golem is gonna march through. Same true for the red team down at the bottom of the map. I think from all the maps that we now have, that we brought back, I mean, we've been playing Warhead, we've been playing Blackheart's Bay, and Haunted Mines. I think from all of them, honestly, Haunted Mines is by far the one where we'd still say, okay, this is still working in a competitive environment very, very well. But yeah, the teams even... I mean, in this case, we are choosing the starting map, but the teams have, I believe, even opted in for Haunted Mines as a map over Braxis, <laughs> if I'm not completely mistaken, for our current map pool here. So yeah, it is it is kind of wild. But yeah, Ether apparently having some problems, and as soon as we're, he's back, we're obviously going to continue with game number one here. And we're back. Apparently, Ether disconnected and needed a second to uh, get into the game. Not really the best start into uh, the finals if you have a player that starts disconnecting in game number one already. So let's hope that that was an isolated incident and it is not a symptom of what's about to come today. But level 10 is now kicking in for the two teams just in time for the first objective. 
top side, of course. They're already setting up here. Uh, Arthas, by the way, has now gone into Frost Presence, into Frozen Waste, and Icebound Fortitude. So no plays around Death Coil or anything like that. It's just really trying to control Greyman in particular, which he can, of course, do very nicely. As long as you control the auto attack speed and everything, you find yourself in a good spot. Great save, by the way. Diablo still alive. Arthas too. Dibbles goes in. Light Bomb, Barbecue, and Greymane is gone. Diablo sacrifices his souls for it. But this could backfire against the blue team in a moment. Genji, on the other hand, has different plans. He comes in and takes Arthas out, and they can even crush Hogger. So, momentum, baby! Yep, that was a big one. Getting three kills with the first objective is actually huge. They have Siege Giants now at the top, and with only two defenders, this is not going to be easy. The bottom fort has been taken out, though. Siege Giants have been claimed previously as well, and we have the Golem up at the top. I suppose we're going to look at the exact same outcome. So both teams walk away with a fort destroyed. I don't really think that Team Ash is going to get much more out of it. They have a half level lead by now. But I suppose it depends a bit on whether or not they can kill another hero because the fight is still in front of the gates here. So yeah, they're moving back out. Bottom of the map has now been defended against, but yep, there it is. And that is what I said earlier, the power of Sylvanas. Them taking down half the HP of the bottom four now results in both teams having the exact same situation regarding structures on uh, the map. So, yeah. Camp still getting taken. We have no big surprises when we're talking about Surug abilities. I mean, Army of the Dead is now in. We've seen a lot of Syndragosa, and uh, technically you have like a triple frontline right now. So if they really wanted to, they could have just said, you know what, we're going to play Arthur's in uh, more of a bruiser role here, or more of a utility role when we're talking about his ult, and we're going straight Syndragosa. But instead, they're just trying to keep him alive and sustain him through these fights. So, yeah, trying to go for Greymane here. Quest is also completed now for Arthur, so good for him. Light Bomb! And countered by Blaze and the Bunker. As Varian comes back out here. So yeah, not too shabby. Six kills to three. Still the lead for Team Ash. But it is a pretty sweet back and forth for game number one. Now, there is, by the way, a loser's bracket. So we are in the top four now. The top four teams are playing a double elimination bracket, which means that if you lose a series, you still have another chance to make it into the grand final. So there's at least that. Now the rotations are still going top sides. They have pushed this out heavily earlier. So it seems like Lopaka is still trying to get some extra XP and Genji is helping him, anchoring the play on the flank. Which really has to because if Greyman gets flanked like this, then yeah, bye bye Greyman. I'm talking about bye bye. <laughs> Arthur's nearly said bye bye over there. But he's still alive. Uh, X strike out as Genji realized that he was getting caught and uh, Genji actually dodged the arrow. I'm not quite sure if he caught that, but take another look at that play and watch Genji and have a look at Sylvanas as she pops the ult. Actually, we're going to wait out that fight real quickly. Uh, it tracks. All right. Can they take him? And yes, they can. Diablo is down. Nicely done. So this is guaranteeing them the camp and gives us a chance to take a look at the play. So check out Genji and have a look at Sylvanas. So Genji is coming in here, gets caught, and then has to X-Strike out and dodges the arrow. I mean, really, just clutch play by him. If Sylvanas hits that arrow and he gets silenced, he is pretty much dead. So really good reaction. Now Anduin is dead too. Bishop's just beasting it, getting a second kill, trying to escape here. <laughs> and Greyman finds himself on the other side of the wall. But with Bright being helping out right away, that's not really a big deal. So they can go for the bottom fort. Blaze is already in the mines, making his moves there. Nine kills to three now overall, but this is big structural damage. And Hogger has to be careful, because he doesn't really have anybody assisting him here. So he's trying to spin out quickly, which he does. But at the bottom of the map, we have still the next move being made as Lopaka is starting to uh, yeah, push the wave out. Create a little bit more space for them. They can still go down into the mines here. The leading experience is, of course, now in Snowball just a bit. So they are farther and farther ahead. 28 skulls, 30 against uh, 20 now in total. The fort at the bottom of the map hasn't been destroyed yet, but uh, that is going to happen eventually. At level 13, we also get the Shattered Armor. Yeah, now the question if they can sync all of this up properly. Because if they can, they might have a chance here. But they are trailing the experience, and uh, I am a bit worried about that level 16 talent that's going to kick in soon. 
Four destroyed at the bottom of the map. Fight at the top. And yep, that's Varian gone. Bunker was on the ground, but he wasn't quick enough here. You can just tell that Varian is not really a prepper. Blaze definitely is, so he would have entered that bunker instantly. Varian was just like running around looking for the entrance, couldn't find it, and he's just like, I like never dealt with this. So, yeah. I mean, honestly, this is also the answer where all the toilet paper went during COVID. It's all in Blaze's bunker. There's so much shit in there, you have no idea. I mean, if you're looking for something, Blaze probably has it. Like, that guy has been a prepper all his life, hoarder into prepper, and that bunker is filled. It's filled with stuff. Bottom of the map, more skulls for the team. And again, level 16. Any second now. Ooh, Ether? Didn't Ether already... Uh, pause the game earlier. How can he pause the game when he's the one dropping? He's actually not the one dropping. Sylvanas dropped this time. So, hmm. I think they have a little bit of a problem here. This is the second one that now dropped. Or is it? From their team? I think so, right? <laughs> it was people from the red team that dropped so far. <laughs> Uh, uh, tactical pause, tactical pause, like talking about, you know, the next set, because they are in trouble. I mean, look at this. Up at the top, we now have, uh, first of all, Opaka and Renella pushing. There's a siege giant camp. You look over towards the wall, there's already damage done. I think the siege giants are going to make it in and at least take one of the towers out. That opens the place for the keep. Down at the second layer of the map, we now have Richu trying to take some additional minions towards the golem. But it's 36 to 27, so very likely the big one is going to decide again which team will have the bigger one. This is not a winner-takes-all objective or anything. And with level 16, I'm honestly... I mean, if the time frame works out, for if the red team can delay it a little bit and get their own level 16 to defend then at least there's that you know but if on the other side team ash is now really starting to move down into the mines and get this one super quickly and then push with the objective at the bottom of the map where the golem is now going to spawn then they can just like move easily through the map and try and open up that bottom wall a bit more and they've already opened up the side wall here in the earlier fight because Greymane was stuck on the other side and then had to try and get over so they opened the side wall for him which means that if they push now they have easy vision what's going on on the other side of this so it can be super dangerous you got to be a little bit careful with that but yeah l l let's see how the enjoyers are reacting to it because they certainly got to do something right so it seems that it's actually arian that is disconnecting here not ether i'm also a little bit confused right now maybe it was ether earlier and arian now but whatever it is like that Internet is having some troubles. Didn't they say something in one of the qualifiers also that Polish internet has been a little bit shaky lately, at least where a couple of them live? I think I remember something like that being said. Now, I hope that it doesn't impact the play when it's in the game itself, but here is level 16 and that gives us exactly the situation that I was talking about. So they're getting all the skulls. They did that right away. They want to push for the level 16 advantage. I am just not a hundred percent certain if that works out timing wise. Half a level is not all that much that I have to soak. Now being forced into that fight, that's a different story. Yeah, losing heroes now would be bad and Diablo is gone. He has souls at least, so he'll be back. But that's obviously not good news. If you're already starting to lose heroes and some of the advantages that you were running before the golem even arrives, then you know you're going to be in for a tough one. We have the fight focused straight onto the siege giants now, so they're trying to enhance that push even further the bot lane. The goal is to destroy the keep. That's the goal. They want to take the keep out. We're now 14 minutes into the game, so that's definitely a realistic proposition here with a 65 skull golem as long as you push. Sylvanas hasn't done enough in this game yet to counter pressure this. Up at the top there's obviously a four that will likely fall now. I don't think this is going to survive but the bigger part is really what happens down here and they're looking for kills at the same time. They're going for either Blaze might have to bunker it up. It's still fine. Here's level 16 for the enjoyers. But the boss is already on the keep, takes the minion wave out. Easy peasy, and Arthas also gets killed. Unless they get counter. Oh, light bump! And yeah, it didn't connect because she had to retreat. Genji down, Anduin down. So yeah, that's two kills. 
against the red team. Sylvanas makes it out, but the keep is going to get destroyed. And this could get much worse because now the core is next on the list. And with Siege Giants and a 50% HP Golem, you have a chance to go straight in and take this one out completely. Can they pull it off? They will definitely do core damage. The question is, can they finish the game here? And chances are pretty darn good. Genji is missing though, but you still have Grey main. Varian is out though. 60% Diablo. That has to be it. I mean, 40% on the core. Look at that golem alone. That is just too much for them to handle. Game number one goes to Team Ashes. They take the lead in the winner bracket in this best of five series at the Bungie Cup Finals. GG. Before we head into game number two, make sure that you subscribe to the channel if you haven't done it yet so you don't miss out on any future content here on Calder TV. Garden of Terror, our second map in the best of five series here at the Banshee Cup. So Team Ash has taken the lead against the Enjoyers. As I said in the series, this is a double elimination system. So even if you lose here, you still have another chance. But of course, we just had the first map and that's pretty much it. The heroes that were played cannot be played again, so you will see each hero at a maximum one time per series. And now the question is just simply, who is gonna pick what? And, of course, are we gonna get any bounties? That's the next question. Just as a quick reminder, these are the bounties that can be chosen. They are absolutely optional. You don't have to go for bounties. And on the one hand, I think we're gonna get a few bounties today and tomorrow in the final matches of the tournament because it's best of five series. So at some point, you know, you might be tempted to bust out your butcher, your chogal, or whatever it is. Then again, there's now a lot of prize money on the line and each team thinks they have a chance, of course, to win the tournament. So we might actually see them just focusing on taking the games and not risking anything by giving themselves a little bit of a handicap. As I said before, we have, a, we have a second season of the Banshee Cup planned. We will make some adjustments to the bounty system. We're still going to use a bounty system, but we're going to make a couple of adjustments to uh, give the players a higher incentive. So. Hanzo gets, uh, gets picked. Uh, yeah, first pick here in Garden. Hogger was already played, so he would have been a high priority ban or pick if he was still in this, but no. And what is the double choice for the blue team here? I mean, Jojo is out, Uther is now out. That really limits your options a bit on the front line. But, ooh, false dad is a very early choice. Okay, yeah, with the Haka band, they go for false dad, so they have some global. We can still use ETC with stage dive, you can go Vikings, you can go Samoro, you can go Abathar, so there's a couple of choices of what you can do. The bounty was actually attempted the most so far uh, was Abatha with monstrosity. And it just didn't work at all. In one game, I believe it could have worked, but it also felt like uh, the, the person who played it has never before played the monstrosity and didn't read the talent. And then on the other side, we had Hazu played once, which worked pretty okay, but they were absolutely, it felt like they were just outdrafted. The com didn't stand a chance, and even Monty the Monstrosity could not salvage the situation, so unlucky. Sonia for camp clear, together with Rhaegar. Now we get Zara tool in as a ban, and the final ban for our first, uh, for our second map. What are they worried about? I mean, Falstead is something that Bishops has been played a lot. So, you can ban some of the supports out, I suppose. Ah, but they go for Chromie. I don't like Chromie either. I'm absolutely behind this ban. Get her out of here. Yeah, the only thing that I want to hear from Chromie is... Bye bye! Exactly, so... Buzz off. But... When it comes to damage, I'm actually looking at some mages. And a bit of mage action here. Turanda. Yeah. So stun into stun. And we got ETC. So all of a sudden you have ETC with a potential stage dive for double global. And you can use mosh pit as well. But you have a lot of stuns. You have ETC Turanda, Murden Turanda. So there's already three stuns that they can chain to unload a full combo against anybody that gets caught by it. 
It is he likely gonna go for a more speed so can zone them even further away from an objective or whatever else they wanna do here. If you catch somebody alone on the map, you can still burn the cooldown in order to get a kill. May and Imperia. So another triple front line for the enjoyers. A little bit different here, but also some CC that they are able to cobble together. And now we got my try as the final one. Okay, what are we getting for my try? Yeah, they still need a bit more range damage. I would love to see a mage at this point. Ah, and they go Malthal instead. All right, fair enough. So you have last rights now. Okay, against the triple front line here on Rega, could work. God of Terror, game number two. Let's go. It's really game number two, I promise so, but uh, I, uh, you know what, I would actually love to sometimes just like blame little mistakes like the scoreboard change that <coughs> totally didn't just happen now <coughs> on uh, some little helpers that I have, but yeah, this is pretty much a solo show right here. While Cross and Rob are helping on the admining, they don't have any influence on the overlay. So yeah, that one's on me. Renella and Taranda for Team Ash in game number two. We got Bishops on Falstead, Morenas on ETC, Maitri on Muradin, and Lo Parker on Marthael. On the right side of the map, the Enjoyers with Lavakal on Rega, Itrax on May, Ether on Imperius, Arian is playing Hanzo, and last but not least, Richu on Sonia. Okay, level one, we got the Guitar Hero for ETC. And to run the starting things off with Ranger. So, let's have a little bit of a look at which team is able to claim victory in Garden of Terror. And if Team Ashes is able and willing to pull ahead with the 2-0. Or if the Enjoyers are now bringing this one back. And essentially turn it into a best of three by tying the score. Down at the bottom of the map already. We'll move. And Mirren and Tirana is actually a super powerful combo and something that was super popular for a long time. And this is exactly why. <laughs> like exactly what you just see here. So this is typical Mirrodin and Tyrande play. You roam the map as a duo, you go into a lane and then you just take people out. So here's another quick look. ETC can do the same, but yeah, the two of them come in, Stormbolt, bam, follow up by the Lunar Flare and then Imperius gets killed. That's exactly how you do it. And this was specifically at the beginning of Heroes of the Storm, one of the most popular comps that you could possibly get. We have seen it with ETC as well, Power Slide into Stun. Those were also the days when ETC was played with Kalthas a lot for more or less the same reason. And they actually, what? Okay, ETC uh, is very optimistic here. <laughs> the Morenas, yeah, some honorable Sudoku if I've ever seen any of that, so yeah. After ETC committed Honorable Subaru, we now have a uh, first uh, like, kill for each team. But yeah, like, checking this out is fine, but then moving on to the point when nobody rotates over to help you out seems ambitious to me. He must have realized that there's a good chance somebody's moving in against him. Instead, we have normal Sail caught at the bottom of the map. And Lo Parker dies too. Malthael is gone. The first seed is about to approach. We have, by the way, now the reverberation for Muradin. And also, first of all, Leloon's Chosen and Hammer Gains for Taranda and Falstead. But yeah, first seed is spawning now. A little bit further over towards the blue team. So they have a slight advantage trying to grab this one. Nothing really too fancy or anything, but hey, it's there. And let's see what's exactly happening from the red team's perspective, if they are willing to fight for this one. I mean, right now it's only Toronto that is currently dealing with it. Which is, by the way, also a nice pick for the map, because whenever your opponent is trying to channel anything, go for a C channel here, you can just easily send owls across the map and stun them out by yourself a little bit of time. Falstead flying down to the bottom of the map as they're making a play for Ether. So while the global worked out for them, it doesn't seem like they can really pin Imperius down and drop him. What we're getting instead is a rotation from the red team. Oh, stun though. A little bit of free damage for the birdie. But ETC is again in trouble and slides away. Went also into the crowd surfer here, which is of course going to help. Oh, Imperius! Yeah, that's not happening. 
I mean, it was a nice effort by Aether, but uh, yeah, it was n I, no chance. Rega was trying his best to heal him over and over again. Couldn't really make it happen, so unlucky, I suppose. I mean, the man tried. Yeah, tried the best that he could, but yeah, not going to happen anytime soon. All right, anyways, uh, we're now all of this playing out. We have the first seed claimed, so it's a little bit of an advantage. There's nothing insane, nothing too fancy, but yep, tiny advantage for them now. Still a bit of an attempt in uh, the middle of the map to try and get a few additional kills. My try, for example, is getting... Does he get a farm? No, he's actually getting his cooldown back and is able to jump out of the fight with ETC trying to replace him, apparently. <laughs> he's having quite a bit of fun with that, doesn't he? <laughs> Flies, uh, like, slides in, slides out. It's a cool talent. It's really a cool talent, specifically on the utility side. Now, down to the bottom of the map, we now have ETC going up against Ether again. His level 10 choice will be interesting. I personally still believe that we are going to get him with an easy choice in the mosh pit. You could go into stage dive if you really want to apply backline pressure, but against Hanzo, I just don't see it. If he gets a good stun, uh, sorry, good mosh out, that's going to be way more val uh, val blah, valuable for them. Words are hard. So, second seat is up. And it seems like the blue team has a good chance of walking away with another one. Level 10 is equally far apart for all of them. ETC still sitting at the side. And May goes down. Yeah. That is kill number three. So, Team Ash. Maybe pulling ahead again here. And already Lava Carl. Oh, but that's two seats against zero, and that's honestly really awkward if you are the red team now, because it essentially means if you want to avoid Garden Terrors, then you have to now fight for every single seat that is spawning from here on out, and it doesn't... Oh. Malthael is getting murdered a lot here. And we get stage dive. No more pit, stage dive instead, and there it is. Stun, 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 stun. Alright, Soy Boy is gone. I'm actually asking myself right now, who is the bigger beta? Hanzo or Anduina? Probably Anduina, right? <laughs> 100%. I actually doubt that Anduin can grow a beard. So, yeah. I should probably put some, like, fake beard on or something, you know, just, like, getting a little bit of makeup and there's somebody sitting here just, like, trying to paint it on. Hanzo, while it is an ugly hipster beard, is at least able to grow some hair in, in his face. So, yeah, there's that. Four kills to three. When it comes to ults, there are no big surprises. The only one against stage dive. And Marcel is holding back his ults. Eh, we also have Starfall, by the way. So, yeah. Starfall is in. And there's the seat down at the bottom of the map. Where's the owl? That owl is a bit late, isn't it? Nope. Just in time. Okay, so a little bit of owl smooching happening, but they're just delaying it as they're rotating over to try and take out the top side fort. The position of the tribute isn't really great for Team Ash, so just letting this one slide. And at the same time, with the red team now starting to move in, ETC zips out. I love crowd surf as an ability. I really gotta say, it's one of the things that I absolutely adore for plays like this. Morenas has been using it time and time again right now to uh, just make some real nice utility plays. And I think it's one of those talents that is really giving a hero a completely new dimension. And yeah, I, I love that. I absolutely love it. When uh, they can set things like that up, it's pretty cool to see it in action and used well by a player. Arrow against Malthael. Yeah, there's also a quick gust to make sure that the aspect of death doesn't get deaded again. Delivery of false deaths. Oh, the snowball. And there it is. False deaths gone. Last rights gets a kill on Rega. So that's a support eliminated. But Tirana dies too. It's a bloodbath. It is an absolute bloodbath. Sonia with the spin to win attempt. And she actually gets out. Good for her. Whereas Marzael is... No, he's alive! He's alive! And they're getting another kill. But they're also losing Murden. Murden drops Imperius, then gets killed a second later. Six kills to six now. Everybody is just rotating away. But yeah, those were some spicy plays. And Forza is already back to business, as they're now going to try for those Garden Terrors. And it is a stack, of course, for Marzael, which is kind of nice for him. That means that the cooldown reduction is already starting to kick in for him. 
And eat. Hey, hey, what? Okay, so ETC gets caught again. I mean, these are just. It, it sometimes feels like there are a few couple or a couple of unfo uh, unforced errors that are just awkward. And now it's a five versus four. So while they can interrupt for quite some time, can they interrupt long enough to get ETC out? He has his stage dive up in just a few seconds so once that he's back he could stage dive in if he really needed to Malthel is now rotating over there's the interrupt by Muradin Arrow they're trying to go for him my try and there's ETC ETC is coming in goes for the slide and bye bye Imperius boy that was good well coordinated nicely done easy kill right there they try to go for Hanzo they can't kill him but instead oh, ETC with another great slide and stun that's Sonya gone false that is on the channel that's Garden Terrors they might lose their top fort and yes they do they are losing the top fort top fort is gonna well no way they're griefing! The minions are griefing! Look at this! They could have just easily taken it out and the minions are just like, nah, we're fine. Shift targets onto the opponent's minions instead of just dropping the keep. I mean, that is an F for effort right there. That was the easiest play in the world and they just didn't want to do it. They are definitely paid off. Somebody should check their PayPal history because these guys were definitely paid off. I mean, 100%. <laughs> a thousand esports dollars. Oh, Ether? That's a kill, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Nice attempt by him to use his ult in order to dodge last rights, but unfortunately for him, that didn't work. That was a pretty good idea, though. Two forts are already destroyed. Falser is flying top as they were hoping to go for Sonya. He can get some damage in, but not enough. And can they instead take the birdie on? No, they cannot. At the bottom of the map, Garden Terror is doing work. We have level 16 talents now in the game for the blue team. One level lead, a little bit more. And in the middle, yeah, I don't think they're going to get the A4. They can do some damage. What would probably worry me a little bit more if I'm the Enjoyers is that Malthel already has three stacks. That's a 15 second cooldown reduction. If they are able to get a few more for him, he will become a menace in the late game and will be able to just spam his ult during teamfights if it ever gets that fine. 33,000 damage done by him also underlines, of course, what's happening here. But, yeah. And with a double global, you always have side lane pressure. So map control is now in the hands of Team Ash. <laughs> Even at the top lane, where the Ford of the blue team doesn't have any hit points left. But it's still standing. So, two fights breaking out. Top side, bot side. I'll get sent across. ETC is already sliding in. That's four heroes that are currently being occupied here. And with three pushing at the top, that's a free wall. Easy. Take the wall down. Both teams now on level 16. Muradin's jumping out. Arrow. Nice connect. Much better connect than I expected. And I think they're in trouble. <laughs> and Tirana's just dead. The Karen of the Storm has been eliminated. With that green hair, there's only one thing that she can do, and Muradin gets murdered as well. It allows ETC to go for the fort in the middle, on the other hand, so it seems like Team Ash is going to get something out of it. And at the bot lane, the keep has taken damage too, so while the two kills were really nice for the enjoyers, I'm honestly not really so sure anymore if that was worth it. They lost a lot. Now they gained some experience. If they can now take Lopaka down, even better. But they can't. False that gets killed though. And Hanzo is able to also drop ETC. And now it's Marcel that dies. So that changes things quickly. Five man team wipe, baby. Entire blue team gets wiped off the map. Great job. And that means 12 kills against nine for the enjoyers. Yeah, exactly. Nine. And one fort at the top has been destroyed. And I guess the one in the middle they're also going to get. Now, there is another seed that they can take. More seeds, more plays. So, let's have a look on what's going on with that. And here. Already a little push over here. Uh -huh. Trying to steal a couple of the camps away from the opponent's team. Sonya's doing the same thing on their end, up at the top. So I was trying to take this one to apply more pressure towards the top lane. At the bottom of the map, there's still a catapult that they have to take care of. 
But I mean, generally speaking, it's all still good for uh, the blue team. They have taken, of course, some damages after all of this. But they are still in a position where they can at least fight back. So it's not like they've fallen too far behind here. They have lost two of their forts. One was essentially already destroyed. It was only being held together by some chewing gum and spit. That was it. But the inexperience is still even. It's more so a question of what's now going to happen with the next couple of seats. Because the situation that the red team was in earlier, that's exactly what the blue team is now experiencing. They have to fight for every single seat, or they're going to have to face off against Garden Terrors. And given the current situation in the game, probably want to avoid that. You don't want to be the first team to lose a keep after you've been off to a great start here. Cooldown reduction for Marthel could again help them now. False stat at the side, careful, doesn't want to get Hanzo'd. And the channel is happening. There's one camp pushing at the top, and there's catapults down at the bottom, pushing for the keeps. That's good news. Bishops is looking for the angle. He wants the angle. Where's that gust? There it is. Gets the gust in. Stage dive, and bam! Muradin gets murdered. Ah, Hanzo gets murdered by Muradin. And the last. Oh my God! <laughs> Three heroes down. That was pretty sweet. Really nice attack, and now they want to go for the keep here. Pretty sweet moves from the team in blue as they are now hitting level 20. First Hanzo died, then they went for Rhaegar. The avalanche didn't really go where they wanted. And now there's of course the chance to not only go for the keep, but also go for core. Specifically with Mei now gone. I mean, they still have to take this out. The funny thing is though that they lost the seat. <laughs> so with the seat lost... <laughs> it's a bit wild. Guys, you know that you have to take the keep down, right? Like, I'm, I'm just a quick reminder. Before you go for the core, you have to take this one on. And they nearly lost Martha Ale to the keep. Now, this is pushing at the top. So, if they are not able to end the game here, that would be hella awkward because they are likely going to lose that top keep. But since they're already working the hit points down and now they're even getting the kill against Sonya, I think this is going to be a foregone conclusion. ETC is having some fun and is jumping around. We got Epic Mount, we got Crowd Pleaser. And with now Hanzo dying and everybody just funneling into the damage, this is going to be a 2-0 lead for Team Ash in this best of five series. So the Enjoyers are on their last leg pretty much as we are moving into match point number one for Team Ash after their victory on Garden of Terror. GG. Battlefield of Eternity, game number three. And well, guys, it's match point. This could honestly be the final map. Now, again, this is where it starts to get interesting because, as I said before, now we find ourselves in a situation where for Team Ash, it becomes interesting to go for a bounty. They have a 2 0 lead against an opponent that they've now beaten twice. Now, reverse sweeps are possible. But if at any point you were thinking, you know what, maybe we could pull something off, this would probably be the map to try it out. So Team Ash might go for a bounty here. There's also 20 heroes that have been played that cannot be played again, because you can't play the same hero more than once, like in a series, just in general. But yeah, so now it's going to get interesting. So here's once again, here's the list of bounties, so you can have a look. I mean... When we're talking about what would be possible here, we've seen Chogal plays that were successful in the past. I'm not so sure on uh, the other hand on some of the individual hero ones if they're going to play that. Some of course they can't try anymore. Varian has already been played so you can't play him again. Butcher, I'm not sure. But we could go triple healer, no healer. You could go for maybe that All Diablo, even that the All Diablo play is going to be a bit tricky. So yeah, I'm not sure if they're going to go for any bounties here. But there is at least the option now. If you have a good Kel'Thuzad player, for example, you can try and cheese something in there. My hopes were for the Svenskas to play at some point with Svam Grotta and give us Murky. And then they lost in the group stage with Svam Grotta not even playing on that weekend. So, sad times. I think the, my hopes and dreams of seeing Murky in this one have now been uh, successfully crushed. But yeah, it is what it is. But again, we've got some ideas for Season 2. So, Vala, okay. So we're gonna get some sweet arrows. Very early Vala pick. And I didn't hesitate there. I mean, Greyman is already out, Hanzo is out, so Vala is, of course, an obvious choice. Logical decision. And we get Garrosh. Yeah, that essentially already removes pretty much all of 
I think it's all. All of the potential uh, team builds. Most of them. Uh, Tracer, Tyrael. Technically, you could still go for the triple healer or the no healer comp, which I don't think is going to happen. So, yeah. So, Chen, Tyrael, and Tracer are in. But yeah, I'm a little bit curious. Maybe even Zarya? Honestly, now that I think about it, I'm not quite sure how often the Ash in particular has played Zarya in the past. I mean, Zarya is obviously a really good combo with Garrosh because of that speed bubble on level 4. And we've seen particularly the Swedes play it a lot. There's others as well, like Ixia, just to name one. But this is something that they could play as well. Yeah. Zarya is always terrifying with Garrosh. That 4-man that you can create at the bottom of the map is just insane. There's Cassia, we get Stukov, so we're only missing the side laner. Yeah, this is pretty damage heavy. Just you wait. My try murky. It's coming, boys. It's coming. <laughs> nah, it seems like they're gonna go straight for the next round here. That's what they're trying to do. Okay, so... Sidelin Butcher. Seidel Murky, one of the two. Zagara and Deckard Kane. Uh, Zagara is not a bounty, but they are dropping her onto the foreman, I think. Chen is still going to be the top lane hero. Okay, so Zagara is in the house, and what's the final choice for my try? Again, they need their side laner. They don't have anybody yet. Battlefield of Eternity could be the final map of the series. So, time will tell. But yeah. Let's have a look at this. Come on. Ah, Samuro. Okay. I'm happy with Samuro too, don't get me wrong. Battlefield of Eternity, everybody. Game number three between the Enjoyers and Team Ash. Game number three. Match point number one. Team Ash so far looking stellar in the series. Renella on Stukov. My try on Cassia. We have Bishops with the arrow build playing Vala. Cassia, by the way, also stacking with Thunderstroke as his level one talent. Lopak on Samuro, and Morenas on Garrosh. Does anybody know, by the way, where some orcs are green and some are red? Like, what is this shit? Is this like the, uh, I don't know, like the the, the climate-friendly orcs, and these guys are the, the brutes that just, like, you know, burn oil and everything? Like, what's going on with this? Like, I have no idea. Well, what, yeah, whatever. Love a call, they got Kane for the enjoyers. We got Ritchu on Chen, Atrax on Tyrael, Ethan Zagara, and Arian is playing Tracer. Zagara in the four-man. So, let's go. Okay, so, with that being said... Uh, Zagara is already starting to push. Okay, let's go. I was already suggested that Garrosh was just hitting the tanning bed a little bit too heavily. <laughs> I can totally see that. <laughs> there's actually like, there's a couple of tanning salons in Spain and I'm just like, what are you talking about? All I have to do to get a tan in Spain is to go outside. <laughs> It's like, yeah, I know that there's a couple of basement dwellers that just hate the sun. I think we also call them vampires, but I highly doubt that they are the ones to go to a tanning salon. So while a lot of these make a bit more sense, I guess, in the, the northern European countries, nothing amuses me more than seeing one in Spain. Where I'm just like, I'm getting a tan just going outside for like five minutes and <laughs> you try you guys are trying to incentivize me <laughs> to go to a tanning salon <laughs> like the business model is amazing it's like selling fridges to eskimos or something along those lines so yeah glorious but yeah anyways uh, one kill against zero with a uh, good old garrosh already being taken out here up at the top we got Ritchu. And he is going up against two. Cassia is actually starting to jump in right now in order to do some work as well. Not a lot of stacks for bishops with his arrow build. Tries to get another one, but nope. And yeah, let's see what's coming with... As the game continues... Okay, there's another one, yeah. I need bishops to just hit some of these arrows. Stack him up. There's a lot of creep already being spread. They're trying to find them and they're doing decent. But Isa still has more than enough vision and they are attempting to use him now to take the camp. But there's Morena's already moving in. 
but uh, yeah, playing this time a little bit different. So they already started to swap heroes around. Morena is now in the main tank position. While we have up at the tour, ooh, Samuro being played. Nice, good hit. But the camp still goes to the red team. So yeah, Ritchu alone on the top lane. They got level four. Lopaka now with that. And here comes Indomitable, and Vala is going to get the repeating arrow too, as Garrosh gets killed again. Ragdoll gets just scattered around here, so the explosion is a bit too heavy. And look at that pressure play! The Enjoyers, ladies and gentlemen, coming in and getting mega, mega aggressive around that fort. Vala also having some troubles, at least able to stack now. It's actually stacking fairly quickly. Yeah. That could really work for them as this continues. But they are losing a lot. They lost the wall. They lost half of the AP HP on the fort. Well, at least they're going to try and get a kill here. Vala with another arrow connected. So, yeah, good for her. Sitting on nine already. Vala's arrow stacking is super important. If she does well, then as we're heading into mortal number two, she is just absolutely crushing that thing. But right now, they still have to work without Monster Hunter can still do enough damage here, but it's two kills to zero in favor of the Enjoyer, so the red team is off to a good start in this game. And we'll see who takes the halftime show here, as the teams are obviously simultaneously trying to get the experience to get the next talent here. But Team Ashes is, is trailing behind. Yeah, 11 stacks now for Vala. That's damn good. 11 stacks and the first objective hasn't even been taken yet? So, yeah, good for Bishops. Gets another one, and boy, if we are, if he continues with that pace until the mid and late game, he is going to murder people. Not only the immortal, he's going to get a ton of single target damage out whenever he's alone facing off against someone. Halftime show has now also been won by Team Ash, so they might not have been able to get the initial kills, but now this is looking good. Another arrow gets YOLO'd out. It's kind of funny, by the way, how Cassia and Vala have the exact same stacks the entire time. One of them picks the stack, the other one picks one up too. <laughs> Garrosh on the other hand, he is, this is not his game, is it now? <laughs> Three kills against zero, and, every, and it's only Garrosh that gets killed. Garrosh gets absolutely crushed. And by the way, as I start speaking about Cassia stacking at the same pace as Vala does, she pulls heavily ahead with 20 to 14 now. Gets then killed too, but at least Bishops is still sitting here waiting for a couple of cooldowns and uh, locks another one in, which now puts him to 15. So they have a chance to go for the Immortal, but in order to do so, they would have to get close here. Yeah, the defense is happening. Bishops is still hoping to connect some arrows. If not, then at least get more stacks for later on in the game. Yeah, well, there's already one. Could even connect the second one. Sitting at 16. Yeah, nice. Tracer is actually really low. Must be super careful now. Another arrow is coming in. Where's... Oh! <laughs> Garrosh, I have no idea what he's trying to do, but he's attempting, in my opinion... Oh, that hurts. Decker down, Tyrael down. Yeah, there's the double kill, and now Vala can go for the Immortal and absolutely obliterate it, thanks to uh, Monster Hunter. But yeah, when we're talking about Garrosh, I mean, he's trying to go for the double digits, apparently. So, there's some kind of personal quest that he is attempting to complete. He wants to go for the 10 deaths, because that is now the fourth time that he has been destroyed. <laughs> Kind of feels bad, man. But yeah, they get the Immortal. It's not really a big shield or anything, but it's good enough. Valon 23,000 is also top damage in the game now. Red team actually looked in, so yeah, they got it. Uh, but Valon will burn that down. The shield was so low that there was absolutely no doubt that this thing would not even get to the fort. 19 stacks for Vala, and then Cassia also coming in with her stacks. So yeah, there's not going to be any damage on the fort. Isn't even able to get the uh, attack animation through. Vala still stacking. She's sitting at 20. 20 stacks. That's big. We're only six minutes in. And she's still getting more. So, yeah, can easily get 21, 22. They might even get a kill here. Zagara is down. To be fair, Samuro also died. Chen is at the bottom of the map pushing for the fort. But now they're taking Deckard Kane apart. And they can push this even further. And the more Vala stacks, the better she is in one-on-one -one situations later, the more damage she gets against isolated targets, the more damage she's going to get against also Immortals. But they're losing their bottom fort now. Yeah, Chen is getting this one for free. At the top, they are also trading, so at least they get this one. Mm -hmm. And now we got 20,000 for Sagara on the damage numbers, but look at Vala, she's already at 30k. 
Bishop's biggest opponent is currently his mana pool. <laughs> He's like, yeah, that thing is empty in no time. So, yeah. Has to be a bit careful on that one. Blade Storm for Samuro. Feels like I'm watching Soaking. And of course, Zagara with Devouring Maw. That is definitely a bounty that we could probably bring into Season 2. What do you guys think? Zagara Nidus as a bounty? I think that's a pretty good one. Nidus Zagara is pretty good. We actually have seen... How many times have we now seen Zagara just in the playoffs? I think this is the third time. So Zagara gets played. But Zagara Nidus... Ah, there is a bounty that we could uh, introduce. 29 to 23 stacks now from Cassia and also from Vala. And yep, this is where the real move starts for Vala as she can start to take out this immortal. Ooh, they got Kane. The zoning old zones them out. Oh, stay a while. Oh, get wrecked. Tell stories until your ears bleed. Yeah, you don't pay attention for just half a second and he's going to tell you a tale of the war and whatever. That actually really happens to me. If I call one of my grandmothers at first, everything is going to be fine and I'm being told about her life and everything. But if you let the woman talk, at some point she is going to tell you about her childhood and that will eventually lead to a war stories. It is wild. So yeah, you need to... I mean, you guys probably know that. If you call your grandmother or your grandfather and you're just like sitting there talking to them, you need to bring a lot of time. Uh, you need to bring a lot of time. So, yeah. And, and strong coffee. I would very heavily recommend coffee or any kind of energy. <laughs> but yeah, uh, six kills to six. Halftime show is already over. Blue team is, of course, looking strong now. Cassia and Vala are both poking as much as they can. And yeah, <laughs> the Hydra. <laughs> the Hydra is just moving in there. Me likey. But yeah, okay, so. I, if anything, that surprises me that it didn't just try and rush down the Immortal a little bit faster here. But they still pop the Fountain. Stukov trying to get a good position. And now, let's go. Over on the right side, yeah, Lopaka is starting to chunk down the Immortal. And Vala doesn't even have to do anything. She can sit here, defend, stack more. Is already sitting at 30. Chen comes in and is trying to isolate Morenas again, who is the prime target for the Enjoyers. They really like to go for him. And the more triple more. Triple more, but also sanctification or Tyrell would have died to the immortal. And Samuro has won the objective now for the blue team. So Zagara is down, Tyrell is down, Cassia got murdered, and Morenas. It wouldn't be a proper team fight if Garrosh didn't die too. Uh, it's kind of funny to me though how Lopaka doesn't give a damn about the entire game. He's <laughs> just sitting there. He goes for the immortal, he goes to the top lane. He's like, yeah guys, I'm on the lane. Like, look at my siege damage, I'm doing things. So he wins the objective for them. <laughs> They're actually in a really good spot. Uh, so yeah. But then again, we have now eight kills to eight. And this should eliminate the bottom four. So the attack comes in. 34 stacks for Vala, 45 for Cassia. Cassia is getting higher up in the damage numbers and is now third highest in the game just behind Tracer and Vala. But nobody is seriously contesting Vala's damage output here. Yeah, and she just get I mean, again, that just murdering Chen. He comes in, gets stunned, stunned, and there's one arrow after another. Chen is gone. So, boah. This is rough. Vala is nearly uh, 15,000 ahead of everybody else here at this point. And she has 38 stacks, and we're only 11 minutes into the game. Samuro has more freedom at the top lane, time and time again. But, yeah. Tough times. So, yeah, that's the fort gone. One and a half levels. If, if the enjoyers want to drop down into the loser's bracket, then they really got to step it up a little bit. They need a big win on the next objective, and the problem is they're likely going to go up against a level 16 advantage on the side of Team Ash. So this is going to make the battle super difficult. I mean, maybe they can, but yeah, that's going to be tricky. Also, Vala with 38 stacks already. I was more worried earlier about the Immortal being hit by her, but at that pace, Bishops is just going to crush everybody that goes toe-to-toe -to -toe with him. So, yeah. Then again, they're zoning them away. 
16 is the timing. Oh, <laughs> 16 at the same time that the Immortal gets announced. Vala now with Manticore. Uh, we get the static electricity. And we get the seasoned soldier. Samura is still totally fine. Yeah, they're trying to get him. Stukov is just sitting nearby. Stukov is essentially just making sure that whatever happens, that he can still save Samura. And Samura already moved back to the top, so he's now pressuring Chen. And here comes Vala. <laughs> Look at the hit points. <laughs> oh boy, come on, give me that arrow. Hey! Should have gone for another arrow. Tyria, bye bye. Oh, it sank. Nice. Alright. Yeah, gets that. Tyria, starting to move back in. Stirwar. And get wrecked. Renella with a big shove, but it's the end of Stukov. So neat. They're getting a kill against Stukov. Maybe now. Keep at the top is a bit in danger as there's still a camp pushing on the lane. They're going for Morenas again, <laughs> and then Cassia and Vala just go full tag team on Chen and drop him here. Tracer's trying to go for the objective, needling her way into the Immortal, but yeah, this thing is already getting low, and Vala is just easily moving over to the right side, but she's a bit too late. Tracer's already done her job, so they've lost quite a lot there. The entire battle, by the way, played out without a level 16 talent for the Enjoyer, so given the circumstances, they did pretty okay. But now there's the damage dealer. It's going to be a 5 versus 4 in a second for at least a few moments. But Vala is now at 41 stacks. Cassia is at 62. And the scaling will continue the longer the game lasts. And then you have Samuro, which of course is even more annoying. Samuro pushing the side lane, just causing trouble. Yeah, red team is losing more and more ground here. And yeah. Just a little bit of outside poke is all that they got to do here. And Vala can do that with the arrow. Cassia, of course, is doing the same thing right now. They're playing it slow, safe, specifically now since we have level 16. But just look at this. Tracer gets caught, gets flipped, taunted, and well, that is the end of this fight. Because in a 4 versus 5 without your top damage dealer, this is not gonna work. So instead, we see Vala maybe pat her stats a little bit as she's trying to move in once again. But the Immortal is still up, so they're gonna go for that instead. 58,000 damage for Vala by now. Another sanctification to save the day. They're trying to go for Garrosh. Even that is a bit questionable. Oh, actually, it's much lower than I thought. Morenas is still alive, on the other hand. And he lives through all of it. And Chen is maybe gonna die. Yes, he is. Chen is out. 12 kills, 2-9. And this immortal is going to be a monster. Big shield. Really, really big shield. And again, size does matter. I mean, that's what she said. So, we have 12 kills to 9. Two levels ahead. <laughs> I don't think they can hold that keep. The question is more, so are they going to lose a few more heroes? And can they maybe even go for the core at this point? So, yeah. Big shield. 60 minutes in. 20? Uh, maybe. Could go for 20. Okay. And, yeah, let's go. Samura is also pushing for the top now. So Samura is pushing for the top keep. They're actually going to potentially even make a double keep play. Unless they feel they can end the game here. I have to give it to Zagara though. She is able to take the Immortal on much faster than I anticipated. There's the ult from Deckard Kane again. He's in position there for him too. But the problem is he gets caught by Garrosh. And even with Chen trying to create some space, they're all in trouble. Deckard Kane is low. Everybody is trying to get away here. And it's just brutal, yeah. This keep will fall. Topside keep takes more damage. Nice triple more by Zagara. And that takes Vala down. That's actually Vala's first death. So great job. This saves their core. That saved the core now. If they lose a hero, it is over. But like this, keeps gone. But they're still in game. Now, that's the good news. <laughs> the bad news is... Ooh, Cassia has taken over the damage numbers. She's on 69,000. Nice. Um, yeah, the bad news... Uh, oh, she's also at 100. 100 stacks. Sweet. The bad news is... This time I'm really going to get to it. Level 20 is ready. And that's a two-level gap that we're talking about. More than a two-level gap. So, have fun playing the next few minutes trying to catch up here. Cassia had 100 stacks. Great job. Really, really good job. 
Vala, of course, with also very nice stacking, as I already said. But Maitrai is really bringing some numbers in. On the triple digits already, and he's pulled ahead and is now top damage in the game. And is very likely to add even more to that. 103, 104, bring it, baby! Take him down! Oh, they do. Teriel is gone. And Samura is making a play for the core. He's already moving to the bottom of the map. He has a camp that is starting to escort in. At the top, they're losing a fort, but some of them will have to retreat now. And sooner rather than later, because this is still annoying. Catapults are gonna likely grief and take the tower in uh, the middle right here. So that's probably gonna happen. But yep, they're already working on the shield. Immortal is spawning and it's still two levels. It's still two levels and Tyrell is also down for another 17. Tough times. Really tough times for them. The Cassia? I, I don't even remember what the... What is the record in a competitive game? In an actual competitive game for stacks on... Uh, on Cassia. I think it was around 160 by Dino, if I'm not mistaken. And that's a long time ago. That was on Volskaya Foundry. Must have been two years ago or something. <laughs> Tracer, not like this! Gets popped! Poor Tracer. Murdered. No chance. Yeah, now Cassia gets a kill. She's at 120. Maitrai is still working it, and he has insane numbers. I mean, yeah. Seems like Samura, on the other hand, doesn't want him to get the record because he's pushing. 25 kills in this 19-minute game, and with a halftime show easily won by Team Ash, it is going to end here. I don't think that Cassia is going to break the record, but it's still hella impressive what she's able to do here. 120 stacks on her level 1. The damage is, of course, just bonkers. I mean, she's sitting at 88,000. Has heavily overtaken Vala, who's now also been overtaken by Zagara. So Zagara's later talents really gave her a damage boost, too. Uh, yeah, more damage coming in from all of them now. As they're going for core and for the victory. Yeah, this seems like it's going to be the end. The enjoyers are going to drop down into the loser's bracket. Specifically since the top keep has now also been taken out. You're completely pinned down. You have nothing left except for the core and some random structures in the middle between the two lanes. But yeah, loser's bracket, it seems to be this would be the most insane comeback if they can somehow make it happen. It doesn't look like it. Uh, seems like Tracer's nearly gonna die. Cassia still attempting to murder Zagara here. And Ether goes down. 127 sacks by now. Another kill for Cassia. But the core is also falling. And it is falling quickly. So, nicely done. A 3 0 victory for Team Ash in the winner bracket of the top four. They move on to the next round. And the Enjoyers drop into the loser bracket. GG.